This is CBC Here and Now. I know there's an attempt by the city to, to improve it, but I, I really see it as a larger issue, not just for the city. We clear 147 kilometers of sidewalk throughout the city. I think we all have a personal responsibility to remove the snow from in front of our house. Our crews to work seven days of the week instead of the five, so we have a crew through the weekend because of course snow falls on Saturday and Sunday as well. St. John's is still trying to dig out from last week's storm and more snow is on the way. Tonight we're asking who is responsible for clearing the sidewalks. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Snow on the ground in piles and more is on the way and it all makes walking around St. John's rather difficult. Yes, for sure. That's because many sidewalks are not cleared and that's bringing back painful memories for one woman who's been advocating for better snow clearing. Here now is Meg Roberts joins us live tonight. So Meg, it looks like uh, you're in a snowbank there. Well, it might look like it, but I am actually standing in the middle of the sidewalk and because the sidewalk is impassable, you notice people who are walking down the middle of the road, which doesn't exactly make for the safest road conditions. I spoke with a St. John's woman who says that uh, these sidewalk conditions make for some painful memories. Just like Frankenstein. <laughs> it's been almost three years since Kelly Bruton broke her leg in three different places on Livingston Street in downtown St. John's. Tomorrow, a doctor will remove those pins sticking out of her ankle, a reminder of her nasty fall. Bruton says for the first few winters after her accident, she had anxiety about walking outside. I thought about moving away um, because I'm not sure how things are going to go here in the winter times. It's a long winter here and I like to be outside, so if you can't walk to get your groceries, what are you going to do, you know? Since then, Bruton continues to advocate for better sidewalk safety on Facebook and she's made some changes to her daily routine, which include wearing spikes on her boots. A city councillor says the city made changes going into this year's winter season. There will be snow removal crews working seven days of the week instead of five. As well, the 2019 budget, which was passed last night, allocated $150,000 to snow removal. We've been creative within existing resources and added some, and, and we believe that will make a difference. Bruton thinks everyone could be doing more to make the sidewalk safer, like shoveling the snow on the sidewalk in front of their homes. I think it's... It doesn't seem to have gotten much better. Like, I know there's an attempt by the city to, to improve it, but I, I really see it as a larger issue, not just for the city. I see it as a provincial problem as well. And you're really, people's lives are being adversely affected. Bruton told me that she's not alone. She says people have been reaching out to her on Facebook who say they're suffering from things like arthritis and other complications from slipping and falling on the icy sidewalks years after the fact. And Meg, uh, she also mentioned that residents should be responsible for clearing the snow in front of their homes. So what exactly is the responsibility of residents? Well, there are no bylaws or policies that require you to remove the snow from in front of your homes. A counselor told me that's because the city uh, can't tell whose snow belongs to who, and they also just don't have the enforcement capabilities. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Meg Roberts. Last week, Ashley Brawweiler and some guy named Eddie warned us all the storm was coming. Why couldn't we have acted on the parking ban last week instead of this week? And another storm's on the way. Does dodgy winter parking keep people from going downtown? That's ahead. And uh, <laughs> yes, so Ashley, um, you're the person of the hour. <laughs> yeah, some things are yeah, better no. left unsaid. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we, uh, we are. We're looking at another round of snow moving in. Uh, through the day tomorrow, if we take a look, we already have uh, a couple of advisories in place. So blowing snow advisories right now uh, for the Avalon, and it looks like uh, we could see some significant snowfall. So here's a, a quick look at what we're expecting somewhere between 10 to 
even 15 centimeters of snow is possible for parts of the Avalon. Otherwise, it looks like a, a 5 to 10 uh, centimeter event, but those winds are really going to pick up, and that's why we have that blowing snow advisory in place. We could see gusts between 70 to 90 kilometers per hour uh, at times through the day tomorrow, so it does look like it will be a bit of a mess. I will tell you what time this snow will fall and uh, when the strongest winds will be when I come back in a little bit. Nalcor's former CEO dug in his heels and pushed back today in the face of questions about the cost estimate and the schedule of Muskrat Falls. Ed Martin adamantly defended the decision that he made before sanction and argued that the government was aware of all the risks when the project was given the green light six years ago. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Ed Martin was defiant, even confrontational. Correct. In incorrect, because you used scheduled again. I, I said that earlier, so I wouldn't have to repeat myself. Commission co-counsel suggested Martin didn't share key information about the risk of cost overruns. Why didn't you explain to them very clearly what the choice that you had made was to go to a, with a P50 number and why you had done it and what the potential consequences of that were? So I just fundamentally disagree with your characterization for openers. At issue was the riskiness of the cost estimate for this project. It was calculated to a number that had a 50-50 chance of happening, a flip of a coin. So who decided to do it that way? The choice that you made, like you made the choice that we're going to do the comparison of P50 and we're also going to make the sanction decision of P50. For the reasons I explained, yes. Okay, but that was your choice. That's correct. Okay. Martin explained why he didn't want to put hundreds of millions into the budget to cover overruns and why he doesn't think it's a good idea to talk about it today. I mean, we're just serving up a platter. Uh, to, you know, the contractors here, which I cannot fundamentally believe, and it right at the time when these things come to fruition. He also said adding money to the cost estimate for risk would signal to others like Indigenous groups that there's money for projects like reservoir clearing to reduce methylmercury downstream. Just a, an extreme amount of detail that a contractor, for instance, or any other stakeholder could use to their advantage that is beyond my comprehension that would come out. Lawyers suggest the public wasn't told about the true risk of cost overruns. But what was the government told? Uh, I did not give them a specific number. Martin says he believes former Premier Kathy Dunderdale understood that. Next week, we'll hear more about what she did or didn't know. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. And that's not all. You'll hear more of Ed Martin's testimony coming up in about 25 minutes on Here and Now. Well, the town of Labrador City is forging ahead with its plan for a regional wellness center with or without the town of Wabush. The mayor said today's town budget will boost funding for a new rec center, raising it from around $560,000 to more than $3 million. He says there are two corporate stakeholders willing to support the project, but funding was contingent on support from Wabush as well. Last month, Wabush Mayor Ron Barron said the Mike Adams Recreational complex would be forced to close after Labrador City withheld funding. But Lab City says that's not the case. Its mayor says they met with Wabush over the summer but failed to reach a solution. We thought that we came up to a reasonable solution to keep that recreational center open for another four years uh, and also help bring us a little step closer towards coming together at a regional wellness center and they denied that. There was no money put on the table. What we did state is we would give $115,000 based on two stipulations. One, our head of recreation department has to go in and do an assessment of the building, which he did and found no faults of it. And two, they have to present to us a long-term plan for regional recreation. Again, they never presented anything to us. The Main Street Bridge in Cornerbrook is now open to traffic. To the first vehicles drove across it yesterday afternoon. Now, the bridge has been closed to traffic since September, but the construction has actually been taking place for much longer than that. Crews built a new one next to the old one and then shifted in the replacement bridge. But the job is not completely done yet. There's still some work left to do on the guardrails and the walking areas, and most of that is going to be done over the next three weeks. And the bridge not paved yet. That's going to happen in the spring. It will eventually be four lanes, and that should cut down on congestion in the center of town.
And property tax is going up for residents in Corner Brook. It's a slight increase. The average homeowner will spend about $74 more this year. That's because the mill rate went up by 0.75. The mayor says changes were necessary because city expenses are going up. Waste and recycling collection now cost more and the city's electrical costs have risen. Business taxes and commercial property taxes stay the same. Corner Brook is also beefing up its snow clearing for roads and sidewalks because the mayor says residents requested it. In terms of our tax revenue situation, uh, our assessments were down. Uh, for residential, I think it was about 3.6% if I remember correctly. Uh, so accordingly, you have to adjust the mill rate to maintain similar revenues. Just like any sort of house, uh, uh, the city has to deal with additional expenses. So it was a very modest increase, but a necessary one. Well, turning to the budget in St. John's now, businesses in the city are feeling the crunch because of an increase in the 2019 commercial mill rate. This, on top of higher property assessments, has prompted the Canadian Federation of Independent Business to speak out. Here now is Jeremy Eaton is on the story and joins us live. So, Jeremy, what's the group saying about all this? Von Hemmond used the word distressed when he described the most recent budget from the city of St. John's. He says his organization has been getting calls over the past 24 hours from small business owners, all of who say that this should have been handled better by the city. Now, in his St. John's office earlier today, Hammond told me that the average small business owner will see an increase of about $3,500 more a year or 7.5% more than last year. Now, this comes on the heels of the 2016 budget, which hit small businesses owners hard. Now they have to deal with rising property values and an increasing mill rate. What this council did was it was given the option of keep services where they are and increase taxes or provide some sort of service reduction and keep taxes at least where they were last year. They chose to keep service levels and what they did, unfortunately what they did was they put the burden on the commercial property owner as opposed to saying these services for residents should be paid by residents. So they've kept services for residents but they're asking commercial property owners to pay for them. And that's the challenge that you have with it. It's, this wasn't evenly done across the board. Now, a couple of small business owners took to Twitter to voice their displeasure with the city and its budget. One store owner downtown told me that he's still trying to figure out the cost, but he estimates it's going to cost him an extra $480 per month. Now, that's compared to residential. Hang on one second there now. You won't be able to hear me. Sorry about that. So that small business owner says he'll be paying an extra $480 a month. Now that's compared to residential homeowners who 79% of in the city will see an increase of about $10 a month. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. And still with the city budget, the city of St. John's has budgeted more money for lawyers this year. The reason? Well, it's being sued more often. An additional $250,000 has been added to cover external fees, pushing the city's legal budget to a total of $1.8 million. Yes, I think that we are uh, being litigated against a bit more frequently. I think that is in part the world we're living in. But I also think over the past five, ten years, we've really put a focus on you know, being consistent with following policy, um, ensuring that we're being fair to, to all um, developers, all residents and all businesses. And really what that ends up being is that there are, there's another avenue that people can take to see if they can get their way or, or find an answer to a problem. And sometimes that's litigation. Just going to get people asking questions so that uh, we can answer them and hopefully change people's minds. Ahead, Willow on Wheels meet the unlikely star of this year's Holyrood Christmas Parade. People don't go to school here, my husband works for the province, but because I was living in BC before I came here, um, I'm not considered a resident. Some residents of this province are caught up in red tape over health care. It's related to an MCP policy that won't cover students, even though they moved here permanently.
Welcome back. There's a major story developing at this hour in France. Two people are dead and another eight wounded after a series of shots were fired at a Christmas market in the French city of Strasbourg. Police say the gunman has been identified but is still at large. One local shop owner says the shooting lasted for at least 10 minutes. Strasbourg is located about 500 kilometers east of Paris. It's the seat of the European Parliament and on the border with Germany, the Parliament has been shut down and no one is being allowed to leave. All right, now back to some more Christmassy uh, mm -hmm. programming and stories for you. Yes, Chris Kringle had some competition at this year's Christmas parade in Holyrood, Willow the dog. Yes, a uh, furry Instagram star was born without the use of her hind legs, but that doesn't slow her or her human down at all. <laughs> Both joined this year's parade to spend, uh, spread a positive message about special needs pets. We are here hoping to raise awareness for special needs pets and hopefully to get people talking and asking questions so that we can show them that if a pet has any sort of disability or problem, that euthanization is not always the answer and that they can lead a long, happy, fulfilled life. Willow is a pup of two of my other dogs and when she was a baby and started walking, we discovered that she wasn't walking great. And eventually over the course of a few weeks, she stopped walking altogether. We had seen several different vets and nobody could quite figure out what was going on yeah. until I was able to see my own vet in Bay Roberts. And he did some tests and he figured out that she has a fractured spine, that she was born with a fractured spine. Willow has changed my life in so many ways. Um, because of her care, having to care for her, and learning how to care for a special needs dog and seeing the appreciation she has for it has taught me so much more patience and understanding than I ever thought I had. Um, she brings so much positivity to our lives. Yeah. She inspires others. It's been quite amazing. Do you think she's going to turn a few heads today in this parade? I hope so. I'm hoping so. I'm yeah. hoping she's going to get people asking questions so that um, we can answer them and hopefully change people's minds. Yeah. Raring to go. Well, thanks to St. John's Morning Show's Gavin Sims for that. And uh, as we mentioned, Willow is a bit of an Instagram star. Yes, you can check her out. Her handle, Willow on Wheels. There you go. <laughs> nice story. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And it looked like great weather during the Beautiful parade. Beautiful weather, yeah. About to change. <laughs> About to change, absolutely. Uh, and you know, it's cold right now, uh, especially up through Labrador. Take a look at some of these temperatures. Uh, minus 25 is the current temperature in Labrador City. And uh, in the minus teens for the rest of Labrador. Otherwise, we're sitting in the minus single digits now. Now, a little bit of a wind chill as well. Uh, feeling closer to minus 32 for Labrador City, and then wind chills are feeling more like between minus 8 and minus 11. And we're going to continue to see these temperatures as we head through the next, uh, at least through the overnight tonight with uh, wind chills in the minus 40s even up through Labrador. So here's a look at the current satellite radar. We're seeing some snow for moving onshore for parts of the uh, west coast and then we're seeing that as well for parts of the Avalon. And if we zoom out a little bit, you can see where the next weather maker is. We've been talking about this for the past couple of days. That's going to move in as we head through the overnight tonight with snow uh, starting at least in the early morning hours. We do still have that potential for onshore flurry and snow for most of the west coast and then spreading further east as we head through the night tonight and then there's that system moving in. So it looks like flurries to start in the morning. That heavier snow will move in through the afternoon. Right now, most of the heavy snow should stay for uh, just the Avalon, but you can see periods of snow will uh, continue at least through most of parts of central and then even the Beeren Peninsula as well could pick up uh, quite a bit of snow uh, over the afternoon tomorrow. So here's a look at the forecast for tonight for uh, St. John's are sitting around minus six. Those winds will ease or stay light at least for the most part tonight. Minus 12 for Grand Falls, Windsor. And then along the coast, we're looking at temperatures around uh, the mid minus single digits. And we are still looking at that chance of flurries right through central, as I mentioned, and up through St. Anthony uh, hovering around minus eight as we head through the night tonight. 
up through Labrador. Uh, doesn't look too bad, just that slight chance of a few flurries. Labrador City going down to minus 34, feeling more like minus 40 with that wind chill. So uh, it, with those wind chills, uh, you could see freezing within two to five minutes. So definitely bundle up if you are heading out and then name minus 30 through the overnight. So here's a look at tomorrow's forecast. Those temperatures generally sitting in the minus single digits. Again, we're looking at that snow and then the winds will pick up. That will be the story. So could see north winds gusting uh, 60 to 80 kilometers per hour with that snow spreading right across uh, the island. Minus three in Cornerbrook. Again, winds picking up there as well, but not till late day. So we are going to see that potential for some blowing snow as well. Uh, up through Labrador, beautiful day expected, but cold. Minus 22 for Lab City, minus 27 with that wind chill. And then down through the straits, we're looking at that chance of flurries and minus six. So here's a look at that blowing snow advisory. Mentioned those winds picking up. That's why uh, it was a winter storm watch. Now has changed over to a blowing snow advisory, uh, but it's quite significant amount of snow. So this is what I'm thinking right now. Keep in mind this may change. This is kind of early. Uh, we are going to see that snow start in the morning, but depending on how cold those upper levels are, we could see a difference. So uh, 10 to 15 centimeters for the most part for the southeast uh, portion of the Avalon. Otherwise, 5 to 10 centimeters looks like a good bet. But uh, the rest of the island still looking at quite a significant amount of snow as well. Anywhere from 5 to 10 centimeters is possible along the coast. So that's a look at the forecast. We'll look at how strong the winds are going to be when I come back in a little bit. To the Buren Peninsula now where a fishing vessel is partially underwater in Grand Bank tonight after it burned earlier today. See some pictures now. These were posted on Twitter by the Grand Bank Development Corporation, and the photos show the Marcel Angie 2, probably 2, that's on fire at the wharf in Grand Bank. The Development Corporation says the vessel is from St. Pierre, but was docked in Grand Bank, and it says fire departments from both Grand Bank and Fortune responded to put that fire out. Well, when you move provinces, you also get a new health card. It's supposed to happen without a hitch. But here in now's Malone Mullen has learned that's not always the case. She spoke to two residents who aren't getting insurance in Newfoundland because of a policy they say is outdated, leaving them caught in a gap and fighting for basic care. Charlotte Morton has lived in Newfoundland for six years. She's married with two kids. But as far as the medical care plan is concerned, She's still British Columbia's problem. I work here, I pay taxes here, my children go to school here, my husband works for the province. I mean, I, I couldn't be more entrenched into the local community in terms of where my social network is. But because I was living in BC before I came here, um, I'm not considered a resident. Morton is getting her PhD. Because she's a student, she says MCP has refused her application four times, leaving her on the hook for bills until she's reimbursed and unable to get gallbladder surgery, which could prevent a life-threatening infection. Certainly it's been the case that I've put off dealing with things because I've been concerned about potential bills. Usually, residents moving from another province permanently are covered by their home province for three months. Then it's up to the new jurisdiction to take over. But as a policy, MCP won't cover anyone landing here from other parts of the country if they decide to study. Angelica Lozen and her partner moved to St. John's from Victoria for good in September. They were left without any coverage until BC relented and reinstated their insurance. Lozen's partner is a student. Both were refused health care coverage here because of it and told if they applied again while still in school, they could be charged with fraud. I'm kind of speechless, really. Yeah, I just want that comfort of being able to call up a family doctor and, you know, make an appointment or go to the hospital um, if I have a certain incident. Morton says the policy makes her feel unwelcome and could push others in her situation to move elsewhere. I don't think it's unusual or something that we should be discouraging that once people start school, they decide to stay here. But by putting these sort of policies in place or, or maintaining these sort of policies, we give people the impression that they are expected to just be temporary. The Department for Health and Community Services wasn't aware of these cases until CBC News gave them a call. The health minister said no Canadian who's moved here permanently should be refused MCP coverage. In fact, he's looking at opening up its eligibility rules. In the meantime, those caught in this bureaucratic web are just waiting for what they say they deserve. A doctor, a checkup, an important surgery, and peace of mind, knowing they're covered at home. Malone Mullen, CBC News, St. John's. 
Well, do you have a story to tell? We would love to hear it. Get in touch by emailing us at hearingnow.nl at cbc.ca or send us a message on Facebook or on Twitter at cbcnl. Well, Labrador MP Yvonne Jones says the revamped Nutrition North program will be more flexible and include more products. That federal subsidy is meant to lower the high cost of food on the north coast of Labrador and in the Arctic, but it's been criticized for not going far enough. In Nain, for example, a can of soup can go for as much as $7. Jones says the Liberals' new measures should lower costs like that, and she says the program will also include regular audits to ensure that retailers pass on those savings to their customers. Welcome the sons of Aaron. I'm looking at this head of grey hair and I said to myself, 50 years. I said, that's wild. In the army town, the lift of my and uh, to be still playing with the same conviction. The key element is Ralph's passion. Ralph's passion for traditional music and his connection with Ireland. I'm not 50 yet. <laughs> that band is older than me. When the band strikes up, the dancing starts. You know, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a thing that you can't take away from you.
Welcome back to Here Now. The diplomatic strain between China and Canada over the arrest in Vancouver of a Chinese Huawei executive grew today with the arrest of a Canadian in China. Michael Kovrig worked for Canada's Foreign Affairs Department in China before turning to security policy analysis with a non-governmental agency last year. The reason for his detention is not yet clear, but some people are linking it to Beijing's warning of, quote, severe consequences for Canada's ongoing detention of Meng Wanzhou. Julie Van Dusen is following developments from Parliament Hill. Well, quite the story here of intrigue, Julie. What do we know about the arrest of this Canadian in China? What's the government saying? Well, Anthony, this hit like a bombshell this morning. If you recall covering cabinet meetings, I was at one this morning when this news broke. But trying to get a cabinet minister or the prime minister to confirm the details, at that point it was just news reports. It took hours. I guess they were trying to figure out, was this really happening, and uh, uh, trying to nail down everything. So finally, Ralph Goodale, the public safety minister, did confirm uh, that Michael Kovrig, who you mentioned in your intro, has been detained. He's a former diplomat just two years ago. He was um, working, uh, um, you know, helping to coordinate the prime minister's trip to Hong Kong. He now works with a group called the International Crisis Group based in Brussels. But as you mentioned, the backdrop is such that the Huawei executive uh, that we're now following in Vancouver, who's uh, applying for a bail hearing, but part of a bigger extradition demand by the U.S., uh, this is the backdrop that is infuriating China. And China has already said that, that it is going to retaliate. So the question is, is this the retaliation? So let's take a listen to Ralph Goodell, who's quite careful, followed by conservative Lisa Raitt. We're obviously worried about whenever a Canadian uh, is put in a situation that uh, uh, puts them at some risk or jeopardy, where there's, uh, uh, there's uh, no uh, apparent or obvious cause or trigger for that. There's also a lot of negative press in China right now about Canada calling us a puppet, calling us a, a lapdog. So obviously sentiments are rolling very, very high. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, Julie. I got some emails from some friends in China from my time there. They're saying, what is Canada up to? So my question for you, if you take a look at this case, what, what effect does all this have on the Hmong case in B.C. And, and really our relationship with China, a major power? Well, I mean, as you heard Lisa Raitt, the tensions are very high and uh, China is uh, furious, has, has called the whole thing a kidnapping. Now that they're detaining one of our nationals, you can imagine the pressure it puts on the Canadian government to bend to China's will. But the government has been saying all along that this extradition case, which of course is being demanded by the U.S., is guided by the rule of law. But the bigger, bigger issue, of course, is trade with China, which Canada has been trying to, um, to, to get more of uh, in the last couple of years, especially since Donald Trump got there. So diversifying with China. So take a listen. China is an ideal uh, and a good market for our businesses, for our workers. So we want to make sure that we have a productive uh, relationship with, with the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. So trade, doing business with China, traveling to China, all big questions. And of course, the immediate question, how is this thing going to escalate? All right, obviously, there are some high stakes in all this. Uh, Julie Van Dusen in Ottawa, thank you very much. You're welcome. O'Brien's questions and Ed Martin's answers dominated the Muskrat Falls inquiry again today. The lawyer for the public inquiry grilled the former head of Nalcor over the financial estimates and the possibility of cost overruns he provided to the provincial government. At times today, it seemed patience was wearing thin on both sides. Here is part of an exchange between O'Brien and Martin on whether he attempted to downplay the possibility of extra costs. The third thing we talked about was the province chose to charge Nelcor a water rental. Okay, Mr. Matt, I'm just going to stop that, you here. We that, will get back uh, to the that benefits. That comes into about 1.2 billion, and when you add those up and take an allowance for the potential to fund an overrun from a debt equity perspective, that's the view we took, and it was and it was substantial. Okay, my question really here, Mr. Martin, is about what did the province understand about you putting forward to them a number that was more likely, the number you were giving them, the ultimate number was more likely to be higher than 6.2 billion than it was to be 
less than 6.2 billion because the number you gave them was a P50 number that only considered tactical risk, didn't consider any strategic risk. So if you'd considered strategic risk at a P50, it would have been a higher number than 6.2. The number you gave to the government was 6.2 at a P50 tactical only. So the reality is, the math on that is that the ultimate number of this project was more likely to be higher than 6.2 billion than it was to be less than 6.2 billion. And my point to you is that that was not understood by our government because you did not explain it to them. You didn't tell them what a P50 meant. You didn't give them the pros and cons of a P50 to a P75. That's the point. That's the, that's the issue I'm asking you to address. Why? didn't you explain very clearly to the people, to the people's representatives of this province, the government officials, why didn't you explain to them very clearly what the choice that you had made was to go to a, with a P50 number and why you had done it and what the potential consequences of that were? So I just fundamentally disagree with your characterization for openers. Just fundamentally disagree with that. And I'm going to go back, and I'm, I'm going to be forced to repeat myself. So, Commissioner, I, please stop me if, if I'm repeating. Um, you know, I'm going to characterize in the way it actually was in what happened. I started off, and I indicated that we had to make a choice for power. It's a comparative analysis. We came down to two options. Uh, I was clear to the province um, and during certain discussions, uh, using a P50 or not, uh, that was discussed. Uh, I didn't seek permission for it, but it was on the table and certainly clearly available to anyone in the, P, in the, the PUE report and other things. So it wasn't an issue that was, uh, was not being addressed. It just was an issue that I felt was the right way to go because other utilities were using it. And on a comparative analysis, because it's the highest probability of an outcome, to me, that was the right place to go. In addition to that, the more you pushed up that type of number on both sides, it, 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 there, it began to favor muskrat more and more and more. I could not help that. Uh, from a, uh, what you're, you're terming strategic risk. I didn't use those terms with the province. And uh, in my career, I often didn't use those, usually didn't use those terms all through my career in, in the private sector as well when I was dealing with executive committees and uh, various shareholder groups and analysts uh, who represented shareholder groups. Uh, I was always, and that was the norm uh, in where I worked, uh, we always talked about the risk in clear terms. Guju is competing in front of a hometown crowd as the grand slam of curling gets underway in Conception Bay South.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, the grand slam of curling has started in Conception Bay South. It's the Boost National, the fourth in the Grand Slam series this year. Brad Guju and his team are playing in front of the hometown crowd once again for you Briar fans. And CBC's curling correspondent Devin Haru, very popular Newfoundland and Labrador, joins us live from CBS. Devin, why don't you set the scene for us? Well, here it is, right here, Anthony. The boys, Brad Gushu and the gang, right here on the ice. They were delayed a little bit. There was an accident on the road here to Conception Bay South Arena, and so the crowd is slowly filing in. Gushu and the team, they were held up in that traffic, so they're just getting on the ice right now. Things a little bit delayed, but I had a conversation with Brad Gushu about that hometown crowd earlier today. He tells me they are fired up. The last time we were all here, they won the Briar Championship. So, Anthony, it is going to be some sort of scene here, and it's good to be back. Oh, amazing. And, and Team Guju uh, is, of course, playing at home. And do you think that gives the team an advantage? I think it does, Carolyn. I really do. I put that question to the boys after their practice here earlier today, and I said, what is it? What is it about this Newfoundland and Labrador crowd that sort of uh, helps them ascend to granite greatness? And they said, how can you not get fired up when you walk out and the flags are waving and the signs are waving? And I will tell you this, though, they are staying in a hotel this week. They want to sort of mimic what they did during the Briar, staying in a hotel. Don't tell me curlers aren't superstitious. They're staying in the same hotel they did during the Briar. We know how that turned out. They want to stick to the plan, stay in their bubble, and soak up some of this hometown excitement. Now, as you know, Devin, uh, Guju has cracked under pressure in this event. Uh, he did win the Briar, though. Does that give him any more confidence heading into this competition? That's a great question, and I also asked him about that, about sort of the, the battle-tested uh, curling uh, journey that he's been on, so to speak, and, and playing in those big events, knowing how to handle the pressure. Two previous times, Grand Slam curling events have been held in Newfoundland and Labrador. He's lost in those championship games. Could the third time be a charm? I'll tell you what, this team, I followed them for the last three years. They tell me that they play their best when they're angry. They blew a 5-1 lead at the Canada Cup on the weekend. They're angry, and I expect them to play some of their best curling here this week. They're playing four international teams in the round robin, then the playoffs, then championship Sunday. I have a good feeling that that team Gushu might just be there here at home. All right, well, listen, Devin, uh, you're going to get back to George Street like you did last time? <laughs> you don't need to answer yes, that. Yes, <laughs> it's all coming back to me. It was, it was all a blur, and it's all coming back to me. <laughs> listen, Devin, thank you so much. Good to have you again. I hope we get to talk again later in the week. Thank you.
Welcome back to Here and Now. I'm joined now by Mayor Danny Breen here in St. John's. So last week, Ashley Brawweiler and some guy named Eddie warned yep. us all this storm was coming. Why couldn't we have acted on the parking ban last week instead of this week? So we, we try to keep the parking ban off until after Christmas, give the residents an opportunity uh, over Christmas uh, just not to be a bother. And usually the weather uh, cooperates. Uh, what's got us now is we have one major snowstorm and then a, a still a significant snowfall after that. We have another one coming and these back-to-back -back storms uh, have created an operational issue. So the uh, the staff have asked that the, uh, that the parking ban be put in place early. Right, but downtown St. John's is kind of unique because my understanding is other municipalities right across the island, yeah. December 1's the cutoff date, right? Yeah. So why are we different? Well, we've always been different. It's been a bit of a, uh, something that we've been doing. The last time I remember, I think it was 2015, we put it on early. Uh, there was a number of years before that where we never had it on early. So most years we don't have to put it on, uh, but this year, uh, you know, Oh, it's uh, it's one of those things and as soon as we put it on we just do the announcements and uh, and move forward right so coming back to my original question mm -hmm. so how come this week but not last week uh, well because last week we uh, we first of all we didn't know that we were going to need the parking ban in place our staff felt confident that they could uh, keep up with it but with the third storm coming uh, on uh, I think it's Thursday night yeah and uh, and with the uh, uh, other issues uh, you know we're still trying to get through some of the sidewalks here uh, we had to bring in some of our street equipment to clean those out because of the accumulation. Uh, it was just better to put the plant ban on now. Okay, so part of the rationale is because you want to make sure that people are still not inconvenienced down it. But, but I have to tell you, Mr. Yep. Mayor, I, I was here on the weekend right here on yep. Duckworth Street, yep. and there were people, I think the term is um, arse over tea kettle. Yep. I mean, some people are having a hard time. Yep. Does this kind of thing dissuade people from coming to downtown St. John's? No, not at all. Part of the parking uh, ban that we wouldn't have put in until after Christmas, but we're putting on early, uh, is we're going is the four the two hour ban from four to six in the morning, so uh, cars will all be off the streets in the downtown, so we can do the pushbacks and that there till we can get back to do the snow removal. So uh, snow removal down here in the downtown is always a challenge. Uh, there's only certain nights we can do it, uh, so this ban helps us clean up the streets a bit more. Okay, let me ask you to put on your uh, Swami Kreskin prediction uh, hat. Last year we saved a fortune with salt, right? What, what are nope. your predictions this year? We didn't we save salt? No, we don't save on salt. See, the, uh, what happens is that we have a lot of freeze and thaw. So we use a lot of salt. Uh, when, you're, uh, when you have a, a mild winter, you save on overtime, and uh, you might save on some repairs to trucks, etc. But during a heavy winter, uh, you, uh, you might have to pay out a bit more overtime. Still use the same amount of salt, roughly, because of the freeze and thaw. Uh, but our shifts are on working anyway, so it's, uh, it's not a real huge cost differential. Remembering, too, that right now we're on last year's, the 2018 right. snow clearing budget. Right. Okay. Well, we'll see what 2019 has in store. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Anthony. So there you go. <laughs> and what this week has in store. Because yeah. There's more snow coming. More yeah. salt. Uh, Wednesday, not Thursday. Right. Yeah. Wednesday is when, uh, so tomorrow is when we're expecting that storm. Uh, and I didn't get uh, to mention the winds. The winds will be uh, strong tomorrow. We'll take a look at that uh, right now. We'll see those winds pick up as that system starts to move in um, into at least the probably early afternoon is when those winds will pick up specifically for the Avalon. But we are looking at strong winds for the most part uh, anywhere along the coast. So Bonavista can actually see winds gusting upwards of 80, even in excess of 90 kilometers per hour in exposed areas through the afternoon. So that with that snow will lead to blowing snow tomorrow, reduced visibilities, uh, even some whiteout conditions as well. So definitely keep that in mind uh, tomorrow. It does look like it will be a messy afternoon. Uh, so if we take a look at what we're expecting through the day on Thursday, as that system moves out, we should see some clearing skies, uh, maybe a few lingering flurries for the Avalon. That temperature is actually going to drop through the day down to uh, the mid minus single digits. And then we're looking at that right across the board. Straits looking at temperatures sitting around minus 11 on Thursday. But again, uh, plenty of sunshine in the forecast up through Nain, looking at that chance of flurries and then same for Lab City as well, sitting around minus 15. So those cool temperatures are going to stick around uh, right into Thursday. Now looking ahead, 
Um, we are in for a little bit of a warm up right now. Not uh, too sure on just how much that's going to warm up. Uh, Friday looks pretty calm. We're not going to see a whole lot happening except up through Labrador. We could see uh, some snow move through, but that next system, as I mentioned on Saturday now with this, we're starting to see some green in there, which is the potential for some rain. Right now it looks like the Buren and Avalon uh, best chance of seeing that rain maybe toward the eastern as well. And then in behind that will probably change back over to snow into the evening and overnight hours on Monday morning. So it looks like it could be a potentially very messy weekend. So here's a look at the long range forecast 10 to 15 centimeters potentially tomorrow uh, for St. John's and eastern Newfoundland uh, could see maybe close to 17 or 18 centimeters as well for parts uh, right on the southeast coast. Minus one should be the afternoon high again. Going to see that temperature drop through Thursday. Uh, winds are going to stay strong though right through Friday. And then again, either rain or snow Saturday night into Sunday for central Newfoundland. Looks like a nice uh, day once we get through to tomorrow, pick up about two to four centimeters and then sunshine through Friday with that chance of flurries returning on Saturday, sitting around the zero degree mark. And then western Newfoundland looking at those temperatures climbing as well. One degree by Saturday and Sunday, so we could impact that snowfall a little bit. And uh, with that chance of flurries on Sunday now up through Labrador, it's going to stay cold tomorrow night and then start to gradually warm up through the weekend and then western Labrador quite cold as well. Minus 30 the overnight low with a wind chill feeling closer to minus 27 tomorrow. So I uh, wanted to share this beautiful weather photo with you. Any mm. idea where that is? Oh, wow. Frozen. Frozen. Uh, Vast bay, I guess. Really? Or it's a lake? No. Central. Lake, right? no. Central. 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 Gander. Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what that hill is when I come back in a little bit. Welcome back. Well, a modern nativity scene is turning heads in Quebec. Yeah, this is one that has Joseph snapping a selfie while Mary clutches a cup of coffee. Because it's, it's like a mirror uh, on our society. It's not very a traditional scene, but it's in the tradition of representing nativity scene in different era, uh, culture. 
Okay, now baby Jesus uh, looks the same, but the wise men arrive on Segways. On Segways. <laughs> the set is the creation of two Americans who dreamt it up as a joke. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's on display at Canada's largest cathedral in Montreal. There they are in the Segways, the wise men. Uh, it's part of a collection of a thousand different nativity scenes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I can see why that turns a few heads. <laughs> <laughs>